Yeah, Liberty Chris is active on Facebook. That's where I talk to him. So I wished him happy birthday this morning. He immediately replied back. So he's around. Okay, awesome. Because, yeah, when I was in New York, it was some months ago, we were going to try to connect, but scheduling. And I was in Brooklyn, and he was, um, yeah, he we were trying to get to B&H. <laughs> So maybe it's maybe it's better that we didn't connect. <laughs> That's a movie plot in a post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> Three video professionals battle their way through robots to try to get to B and H. Well, if you okay. don't see Chris, you can always see Brady. David Brady's there too. Oh yeah, like so. I actually it was um, Tulloch was doing a play, so I I was at a conference, so I didn't get there in time um, for his play. But I did meet up with Todd. So a bunch of the New York people had got together, um, got together for lunch, or sorry for for dinner, and then to see Tulloch's play. And then um, yeah, Todd and I connected. So that's where that photo came with us us together. I was in New York. You've made us all jealous. Maybe NAB this year? Huh? Could be. It's not too far away. Yeah. Remember, remember Christmas decorations down by the 31st of January. The more important date is the cutoff date after which you have not taken them down where you should just leave them up for the next year. Exactly. <laughs> Somebody's got a live mic. Sounds like Alex. Greetings and welcome to Office Hours. If you are new here and you want to learn a little bit about, or more about what we do, head over to officehours.global. Our first and our first hour, we answer your questions around media and digital events of all kinds. And our second hour is typically something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we'll be speaking to community manager of Ecamm, Doc Rock, on all things online community and building, and of course, your Ecamm questions as well. Well, if you producers go ahead and submit your questions now to give our panelists enough time to raise their hands and answer your questions. And you know what, Bill? Let's dump and in, dive into these questions. Are you sure? Are you sure you're ready for this? Okay. <laughs> I'm so ready for this. Those of you who are new to the show, we have a bit of a tradition. If there's someone on the panel with a birthday, we must sing them happy birthday. And today it is none other than our host, 
Liberty White. Liberty's birthday is today. Happy birthday, which means there is singing to go. And I'm going to see if Alex wants to lead this. He has an idea about a slow <laughs> tempo and he okay. thinks it's going to make us better. I personally don't think anything <laughs> makes us better, but let's give it a try. Better, better, not best, not great, just better, better, like a, a slight improvement. So, okay. So we think, I think that if we go a little bit slower, it's easier. It, you just notice the, the damage less. <laughs> so, so anyway, so. But it lasts so, longer. Um, all right. So, so we'll, uh, okay, everybody ready. And so just the, the key is not try to do anything other than just follow along with me. So I'll be a little ahead and everyone else will be theoretically very close to on time. All right. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday dear Liberty. Liberty. And also Q. Happy birthday. I started too low, too. So I put it, I, I, I shoved every, I really I did something very comfortable for me and I just drove everybody to the ground. Sorry about that. That Thanks. was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. You split the, the difference between birthday and funeral well, I thought. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We That's just blew up the sure funeral. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Happy okay. birthday. Happy Thank birthday. You. Happy and birthday. And a special also happy birthday yesterday to you, Keely. So, and wow. awesome to see you here. So, happy birthday, let's Keely. go to the next question. Okay. The next one comes from Vic Hernandez in Springfield, Missouri. And Vic says, anyone familiar with point source audio, comms, headsets, and labs showed up on my Instagram feed. And he's got a link there. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, it, it's a it's a kind of a medium to high quality, um, you know, folks. So it's probably not at the same level as a countryman or a DPA, but it's above a lot of the other uh, headsets that are around. Um, the uh, I think I'd probably lean more towards, you know, some of their comm solutions. There, as far as an on-air mic um, we didn't find, we did some tests and we didn't find that, that was probably something we would probably use on most days when we had the choice to use something like a Countryman or a DPA. But they are considerably better if you find a good sale on them uh, than a lot of the other headsets that are at a lower price. Mitchell? Yeah, most mics need a use case uh, scenario to get a uh, a rating from everybody. So these are new guys on the block. But, uh, you know, fundamentally, I think it's a cool idea to have double miking uh, in one package, double wiring in one package, and backup in one package. So, you know, theoretically, it could be a great microphone. Next question. Alexander Knight is up next from Vancouver, British Columbia. And Alexander says, I'm ready to get a multi-monitor articulating arm looking at this Vivo, Vivo product. Need to make sure the monitors don't get in the way of my camera, which needs to be directly in the middle at eye level. Suggestions are welcome. And he's got a link there to the unit he's talking about. Go ahead, Keely. Yeah, these are the arms that I have that are extending off of my rolling rig. And what I've found is that, that the, the configuration of having your camera in the middle of those monitors means that that will limit how big your monitors can be. So I found that 24 inches was the biggest I could use. And I also had to turn one of, not had to, but it was optimal for me to turn one of my monitors to portrait mode so that I could have the best uh, usage of the space and still be able to keep my camera and teleprompter in the middle. And, and if you're using a teleprompter like I am, that will increase the amount of space that you need in there. So that's the, the that's the limitation of those Vivo arms. They're just not super long. And Alexander, did you want to add anything else since you're on the panel this year question? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I was uh, the 24 mon inch monitor thing. I'm, I've been slowly figuring that out too, because I've, I've been looking at a bunch of different products to try to solve this problem. I thought about, well, do I just put the camera on an arm and attach it to the post directly in the middle of the articulating arm? There's There are companies that make uh, little attachments that can go on, to, on top of the monitor so you can have a camera directly on top. But then the camera, the problem is the camera's at uh, an extreme angle pointing down, and I don't want that either. So just trying to figure it out. Okay. Alex? Yeah, so uh, we, we've actually owned quite a few of the Vivos. We don't use the ones with the desk mount because it puts an enormous, if you if you fill all six of them, the, the link that I saw, are you looking at putting six monitors up or just? Yeah, six. Six. Yeah, so the... Um, uh, to have the six monitors, it puts an enormous amount of pressure on the table. And so we've had it damage the table because there's just so much weight in that one mount. So what we've done is use, we typically, and I know it takes a little bit more space, 
um, there are floor mounts for those as well. There's there's a version of that with a floor mount that comes right up through the back, so it just has a pole that comes up there. Or there's a mount, there's just a floor one that you, or a desk one, and we use that one mostly because we load into places, so we we show up and we'll actually have five or six of those with all the monitors that that, that we build out, and so overall they work pretty well. Um, I I can't remember whether it's the Vivo one or not, but one thing you want to look for is you want those mounts to slide. So some of them have a kind of a rib that goes down across the top and you want to be able to move those monitors and slide them in and out. You can get up to 27 inch with, if you slide it all the way out, but you do, you know, it, it's, it, it's very, com- you know, it's, it's just barely, it's outside of its normal spec, but it will work. Um, and so you can do that. Now I've grown to kind of prefer now, I have I have these two arm Hawanus that are um, that I can just kind of move around. So for my the way I use monitors, when we do them at events, we definitely use the six ups that you're sh- that you're talking about. I have a thing about it. it you just want to make sure that you can lean them in and out and move them back and forth because I want every bezel to be just right. <laughs> you know, like or it makes me crazy if I don't see straight lines going across it. And so if you don't have those controls of being able to slide them in and out and rock them fo- forward and back. You'll have a hard time matching the the lines that be, between the ma- the monitors, um, which makes me crazy. So the um, uh, the um, but I like the two arms because I can just kind of grab any monitor and kind of float it to where I want it to be. So for my home uh, environment, uh, that's what I that's what I prefer. I'm um, in the process of getting a larger monitor and building a teleprompter around it for what I'm doing. So I'm kind of taking a little bit what Guy's doing, but going a little bit bigger. So I'm getting a 4K 43-inch <laughs> monitor and then b- using uh, Maker Pipe to build the teleprompter for it so that I can look straight into it. And so hopefully uh, next couple of weeks, I'm waiting for it. I don't know why it took so long for this monitor specifically to show up, but it was cheap and <laughs> and, and, and big. So that's that's coming soon. And Keely? Yeah, just getting back to Alexander's point about needing the camera in the middle of the monitors, I fully agree that you don't want to be perching a camera on top of a monitor. You just don't get the right aspect uh, or the angle from that. And so what I have is I've actually mounted my teleprompter using a, an Impact BHE 106, and I'm reading it right off the product. That's why I can give you the, the actual serial number. And then there's an articulating uh, vice grip that's uh, holding the teleprompter and that sort of thing. So I, th- e- even though I've had to put that a little bit off center in order to make sure that the the distance of that vice arm works properly within all the monitors, it's very complex. You will be fiddling with this for hours. And just like Alex just said about switching the, you know, pushing the monitors in and out and angling them with all the trying to get the bevels even. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit of a thing, but, uh, but you will enjoy it in the end. And I do recommend keeping that camera in the middle for sure. Next question. Next question comes from Mandy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. And he says, can you recommend sources for acoustics training and certification? Thanks. Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I take a look at a, a VIXA. So VIXA are the folks that put on uh, Infocom and they have the uh, CTS. So you start with a CTS, which is a certified technology specialist. And uh, after you get that accreditation, you can go for this uh, certified uh, technology designer. So there's a CTSI, CTSD, and then the CTS. I'm studying for the CTS right now and it's pretty fascinating. I thought that I knew a lot. I, I, I took the test cold and barely uh, missed it by point three. So it, it's not an easy test. There's a two hour time free test that you could try out. If you want to get your feet wet, it's at avixa.org. And Mitchell? And on the AV side, Cedia is good because it'll teach you installation work and uh, uh, video also. But uh, that's a good uh, certification to get uh, for that type of work. And um, there are also uh, subsets of architectural um, certifications. I'll know John Stork but Walter Stork is one of the top uh, acoustical architects uh, in the country, and uh, they do a wonderful job. I, I'm completely disqualified because I listen to Spike Jones <laughs> And Alex. Yeah, and I would only get the certification if someone asked for it. Because, <laughs> I mean, I would only pay for certification if someone said that was a requirement to get some kind of contract. Um, I've, I've never actually asked or been asked about certification for any AV uh, skill set. So... Uh, in 30 years. So, 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 so I, I, I think that we just want to, you know, I think that getting certification, if it makes sense, if it's something that your business or company or something requires or pays you more for, but as long as you're getting some kind of remuneration for it, it's fine. But, but I, I, again, I, maybe I'm in the wrong 
the wrong fields <laughs> that you that don't look for those things. But I don't I've never had anybody ask. Next question. Uh, the next question comes just from Xander Snell in Miami. And Xander says, I signed up for training from the email Alex sends out in the morning. At the end of the form, it links to a sign-up sheet. My browser crashed when I did this. Should I sign up again, or is there another way to get back to that sheet? Go ahead, Alex. There's probably not another way to get back to that sheet, uh, but we'll take a look and try to figure out what happened there. Um, it should be relatively simple, but sorry that you had that trouble. We'll, we'll try again. Next question. Next one comes to us from uh, Fred Eric Eckert in Bad Herrenhaupt, Germany, and he said, when choosing a professional 85-inch display as a background, what features should you look for? A brightness of 500 candelas per meter squared uh, or non-reflective surface or color management or what? Jason? Um, well, I'll leave um, I'll leave the specs to um, to the rest of the panelists. Um, I'm going to tell you about the thing that you might not think about. If you can find a way to raise and lower and manipulate this remotely, it's going to make all the difference in the world. Because if not, you're going to be spending a tremendous amount of time trying to align things just right. Mitchell, uh, to Jason's point, uh, Chief Stand will do that for you. It's a good uh, solid. Uh, stand to use. And for me, on uh, as, as far as selection, uh, pixel pitch uh, is important. Uh, how close the pixels are together to fight more A problems. And Alex. Yeah, and typically that pick up, pixel pitch at an 85-inch monitor will be fine at 4K. Uh, a 1080p 85-inch monitor will have a, a very wide pixel pitch, as M Mitchell was talking about, and that'll be problematic for you. Um, so 4K uh, 85 is going to work. It doesn't really matter how bright it is because you're going to turn it down to like 25% of its total brightness <laughs> because even on a standard uh, dynamic range uh, because it, it it's always going to be too bright for the person that's in front of it. So um, you're always going to end up pulling it back. Uh, so don't worry about the brightness. Um, you do want to obviously have these amounts on the back, but all the 85s will, or some version of it. It'll be a very wide um, setup. As Jason said, you want to be able to adjust things. When you're building a background for an insert studio, there are three things to do to adjust. One is the TV. One is the, the next is the seat that the person sits in. And the third is the camera. All of those should be easy. If you're not making them all easy, then you're going to spend a lot of time figuring it out. But those three things in an insert stage have to be something that, so we use hot pods. Um, these are made by Sackler or O'Connor or whatever, and you can move them up and down. So you can move the whole camera with the teleprompter and everything else. It's got a high, it's got this um, center um, column that'll move that camera up and down weightlessly, um, you know, and so it's a lot easier to, to manage that. Um, so we do, in, in some cases, use motorized seats, but definitely adjustable seats, but we use the motorized ones are really cool. Um, and we built one that had uh, the hot pod and we didn't get the motorized in for the camera. But then the, uh, the final thing is with an 85 inch monitor, you want a monitor lift that is motorized. Do not get one that's manual. It is a big monitor. It's really heavy. And if you use one of the little cranks with your hand, you won't be able to feel it anymore by the time you get it to where you want, just in case you're wondering, I have practical experience there. So, um, motorized, motorized goes up and down. It's really nice. So those three, if you, if you do those three things, you'll, you'll end up with a, a pretty good setup. Next question. Next question comes in from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. And Chris says, since Cinemaker allows for recording Zoom participants in ISO without prompts, isn't this the best low-cost Zoom method for small creators and nonprofits? Alex? Uh, Cinemaker looks really good. Um, I, I think we want to try to bring those guys back on and see what, what has changed. Uh, I think that you're going to end up seeing an enormous number of ways of recording individuals via Zoom ISO over this year. So we have a feeling that there's going to be a lot of a lot of support in a lot of different applications. Uh, so I would stay tuned and and uh, and watch. Cinemaker might be the best one right now. I, I think that Oliver last week or over the weekend talked about the fact that um, Memo Live will be able to do it as well. Um, and then there's you know a lot of other tools that are coming out to do that. <clears throat> so I would I would uh, if you need to buy something right now, Cinemaker might might be a good solution. But I'd probably watch this year. This year is going to be all about apps. Um, you know, supporting this. So stay tuned. Next question. Sam Wasserman in Detroit, Michigan is wondering, wants to turn our attention to human transcribed closed captioning and says recommendations for companies and or services. What is your workflow for integrating captions into a YouTube stream or Zoom webinar? Go ahead, Keely. I don't want to be that person who says, why human transcribed? You should do it this other way. But why human transcribe? Do it this other way. It's just one of those things that uh, artificial intelligence is really doing a good job with. And there's so many products out there that can do it for you 
uh, with that help. So Descript is my option for non-live uh, transcribing. And if I'm taking captions back into a recorded live stream and I want to buff those up, then running them through Descript and being able to use that intelligence and the way I've been able to train it to my own voice, for example, makes the process really, really fast. And you just can't beat that kind of price based on the accuracy that you're getting. So uh, between that and then when I am live on YouTube, I'm using the automatic closed captioning that's live. It's pretty good, but your mileage obviously is going to vary as to what kind of accent you might have or your speakers have or their proficiency with the English language. So it's uh, it's it's a nice little feature that YouTube adds for you. But I always go back and change the SRT files because YouTube prefers to see that you put a little bit of effort into it and will bump you a little bit in the algorithm because of it. Great tip, Alex. Yeah, so there's a couple different ways. So AI is is taking over slowly, <laughs> slowly picking up speed. Uh, it hasn't taken over yet because there are some some key elements that it doesn't do very well. Um, and so one of the things that, as Keely touched on is poor audio. So and and for a lot of us in events, stage audio. So if it's roomy, uh, if there is a, a lot of us have um, English as a second language speakers, um, these are all things that that the AI gets tripped up on. Now the way that some people solve it is to use what we call re-speakers. Re-speakers basically are in a closed environment. They're in a, basically an a audio booth and they listen to the, and this is sound crazy, they listen to the show and they speak it again into, that's why it's called re-speaking, into the mic. Um, and that, so they're in a closed environment. The, the Dragon style software or whatever AI they're using is tuned to their voice. So they've literally written, read hours sometimes of, data. So it's, it's, it's tuned to their voice. They've been trained on how to speak it clearly and they re-speak it back in and, and the captions roll out. The advantage of that is it takes a lot less time to train someone to re-speak than it does to do to stenography. Um, and so it's about six months instead of three years. <laughs> and so, so or, or sometimes even less. So, so the, um, so that's one of the big advantages of that. Then you use stenographers and those are the folks that are the pros, you know, they're going to go in there and make it work. The big advantage to that is number one, English is a second language. Number two is if you're doing a technical conference, so you're doing medical, legal, or you're announcing new products, um, you can throw libraries into the into the system, uh, into the AI system, but it, it oftentimes still isn't as good as a human who was watching rehearsal and typing along. So if you're talking about, you know, AAA keynotes, which I've worked a fair bit on and managed captions specifically for those keynotes, um, you we still have um, physical stenographers in the room, uh, rehearsing with the with the stage, making sure that all of those things are just right. Um, so for a and and I'm talking specifically about live. You know, so live is a very specific problem. Now, there are a variety of tools. EEG, which is now AI Media, probably is the industry leader when it comes to live. So AI Media slash EEG are they're making the hardware that you see on all your TV shows, um, and they have a variety. Of, they have um, um, Falcon and another. Uh, solution which will do AI, or you can switch through via iCap back and forth. So there is, you can use um, their hardware, and you can you can use a human or a or a machine, and it just simply it's what you attach to it. So those things, um, so that you can depend on the on the price point. They even have tools that allow you to essentially um, uh, have everybody in the phone have a phone. You could literally have an app that everyone can go to our web page. And everyone can go to it and they just look down at their phone and they can see the translation happening live um, on their phone in a certain language. And it's like 27, so some, some amount of money per, per year for that license. <laughs> but but you can, it makes it easy for you to provide it without putting it on the screen and without needing cart. So it's, it, then you're solving the problem for just the person who, who needs that, that issue and you can do multiple languages that way. So a lot, a lot of stuff coming. Um, uh, sometimes you have to use AI. So for instance, Mandarin and Hindi and other things are not, you can't type it in because there's not a keyboard for it. So uh, so you have to do it in post. The only ones that are really easy to do live are Spanish and English because the United States requires it. And there's a lot of people that can do it. Anyway, so those are some of the things to look at. Descript, look, we're testing Descript right now. We're super impressed with it. Um, we've used also Simon Says.ai because it, in, it embeds into, uh, into Final Cut. So you can export, you can say, go to, to uh, Simon Says, and it will just reinsert all of those captions in Final Cut, you know, in their own tracks, which we can then test and edit really quickly. 
Um, so those are some of the some of the options there to to make that happen. But um, as far as streams and and Zoom webinars, um, you can either insert it with the stream to YouTube or many other things. You insert it into the six hundred eight seven hundred eight feed. There's a line twenty one bank, what we call the bank data. It's where you shade the cameras for black magic. You insert that into into your stream, and then you stream it to YouTube, and YouTube will know what to do with that information. Um, you, the other way that you can do it is uh, with Zoom. You you can attach the the the. You can either use their auto, or you can attach a stenographer directly in the back end to the show, so that they can sit there and type away. Um, and it looks nicer when a per human does it, as far as you know, line breaks and so on and so forth as well. Bill. We've been concentrating on live because most of that is, but if you have the little bit of time afterwards, even the best of these automated systems are going to have a percentage that they get wrong. So it's almost always a great idea. I do most of my corporate stuff needs to be captioned just for ADA uh, compliance. And so even if it's 99% accurate, that means one out of 100 words is going to be caught wrong. And I think artificial intelligence is really helping with the there, there, there. Is this the possessive? They are a contraction or is it another form of there? They're getting that more right more often now, but there's not a circumstance where I wouldn't go back and prune it if I had the time to make it good for the permanent record. It's just never going to get to 100%, I don't think. And Alex. And to Bill's point, that's why we like being able to have it go out of our editor and come right back in and reinsert it back into the timeline because what, it do, what AI does really well is get the timing right. So the timing will be perfect you know and so the all the timing's through and it might miss a word or two here and then you just go fix that but getting the timing right takes a lot of time and you get that out of the way really quickly um the final thing is the brave new world in this area is whisper.ai so this is this is the pure ai solution that just you throw something in and it just pumps out all you throw an audio in and, and a couple minutes later it comes back and it's done you know and it, and so it's the it's probably the um the other one that to look at other than descript um and uh and simon says and are those the the latter two that you uh, mentioned? Are they do they go into Zoom? No, no, these or, are oh, these oh, aren't okay. live. So that when okay. we're talking about post, those are the, the 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 only ones that go in. The ones that go into live, the, the the leader for the live inserts. If you're not using the auto ones that are already there, are really going to be the EEG products. Um, there's a whole variety of AI slat or people products that that do that. Um, um, they they've kind of cornered that market. Um, we've had them on in the, in the past, and we may bring them on again. Good timing. Bill? And just to make it easier for you, if you're doing this for post, most of the major NLEs, I know Final Cut does it, I'm pretty sure Premiere does it, has built-in extensions that allow you to do these captions right in the software. You don't have to leave. You do have to send it out. You usually send out an audio file, and they'll send you back a correctly timed sub uh, subscript file, which is, as Alex says, hugely time-saving. Yeah, I was wondering about if it was integrated like with Zoom, as the question said, because like Keely, we've been using Descript and pump that out and then bring it back in the SRT file into like a Premiere. You do have to do a little bit of cleaning up, but it'll be interesting to see, Alex, the one you said that was purely AI? Um, yeah, so, well, there's a, there's a, there's a couple, but the, in Zoom has, I believe, its own auto AI, I mean, AI-driven auto captioning right now that they've, I, I believe that they've enabled. So that's possible there. The, the one that is, um, you know, EEG can do pure AI or EEG slash, you know, um, AI media can do pure AI. You can have a person do it. You can, you, there's, they have the whole gradient of how they get, you can even have all of your libraries and all of your captioning happen on site. And that's important because um, if you're a really large company doing let's say all hands and you're super secretive, uh, you might want that server, if it's doing AI for all those meetings to be on site, not going out to the cloud to be um, translated. Uh, so in secure environments, uh, EEG also makes products that, that can you can put the server on site. And so and then you can also load it up with all your own library and, and so on and so forth. So th there's a lot of movement right now in this area. It's going to be, I mean, we will be surprised when things aren't captioned. And the the interesting thing is, is that one of the things we talked about yesterday, I believe, uh, was you're going to get to a point where you have every city council is not only captioned, but that all that data is going to go, is going to get popped into an AI, into ch some kind of version of chat GPT. It's going to be written into an article, summarized, titled, and put out like 15 minutes after the, after the council meeting. And so, you know, the amount of communication and probably made into an audio book with a, with the voice of your, of your choice. So, um, so those things are all, uh, you know, the summary or whatever. So those things are all coming very, very fast. 
Yeah, just helping the workflow. I just want to point attention to um, Scott. He mentions in the comments that I'm streaming an in-person live event for a senior living center um, honoring 80 plus year olds. So having human captioning with accurate names is important. So he thanks everyone. And we'll wrap with you, Guy. Yeah, one last one for humans. We've been using this uh, app called uh, SpeechPad. Um, and after you've uploaded, real humans take a look at it overnight and they kick out really, really good transcriptions. I mean, if the word XLR is in there, or like in this case, we have RAID, RAID zero, I mean, it's even capitalized correctly. And then here's where you can say download the captions and you can grab those SRT files or there's a variety of other formats here. So I put a link in chat to uh, to these guys. Uh, they charge, I believe it is about a buck a minute, uh, if I remember right. So. Speech pad, uh, let's see, 12 hours of fast turnaround, it's $1.40 a minute, 24 hour turnaround, $1.20, four days, $1.10. But these are, again, real humans. So I take a look at them. And the, and the two other ones, when you're talking about posts, would be we use production, the, the big one in LA is called production transcripts, which we've used. And we send hundreds of, we might send hundreds of sessions to them at one time and get them all back in a couple of days because they can scale up. Uh, the other one, the, the, the other really big one is Rev. So rev.com is, is the, that's all, they're the ones that have humans on the other end doing all the transcripts as well. Next question. Douglas Carmichael is up next and he says, would a double conversion UPS be advantageous for audio use due to its power conditioning versus the other uninterruptible power supplies? Go ahead, Alex. A double double conversion generally is is more stable than than the um, you know um, I can't think of the name of it right now, but um, the the uh, anyway my, my mind is is but the standard UPS is one step down from that. So the UPSs that we typically buy, the APSs that a lot of us have, um, basically have a line going through it, and if the if the line drops, there's a transformer in there that will if it's browning out or whatever will correct for that. Um, automatically, but it's generally passing the voltage from the outside to the to the to your equipment directly. Um, the advantage of a uh, of the double inverter is that what it does is it, it converts to DC and then back to AC, and so it's always going through the batteries. Um, and so um, you know, uh, um, so that's the Eaton, uh, which I think absorbed Liebert, uh, you know, make make some of these double conversion, um, uh, but they're typically more expensive, and they don't run as long or don't run as well over time <laughs> then you know because they're there's there's something going through them all the time um so those double conversions uh, are going to be more stable they're usually used in high precision equipment i would not consider audio equipment to be that level of high precision unless you were really doing something specific generally we found that the APSs have been really successful for us but we our larger kits have had the the Lieberts in them that are uh, the double conversion have been inserted into, but usually we start at like 30 amps when we're doing those. Um, they're not usually, uh, they're not something you usually buy for uh, the smaller, the smaller kits. Mitchell? Is there a way to measure the quality of the sine wave that it puts out? Because some are better oh, yeah. at that than others. Yeah, that's what an oscillator. <laughs> yeah, there's a sign. You, you can you can definitely uh, put it through equipment to look at the sign. I mean, an oscilloscope will do that straight yeah, oscilloscope, away. Oscilloscope, not an oscillator, but oscilloscope. Thanks for correcting me there. But an oscilloscope will, will do exactly what you're asking it to do and, and show you that. So and you see spikes on it or something like yeah, that. It's not. And there's good. there's a lot. I mean, for a couple hundred dollars, you can get a very, uh, you know, it used to be thousands of dollars. It's now for three or four hundred dollars or, or even less. You can get something that's pretty precise um, to look at look at what's coming out. Next question. Next question comes to us from Joaquin Mattis in the Imperial Valley, California. He says, thoughts on the Grammy production-wise last night? Go ahead, Bill. Well, the Grammys is one of my favorite award shows. That and the Tonys, because the live performances are live, and you can see who can really do what they do and who can't. Um, I thought it was fun. My wife and I always sit down and watch the, the red carpet fashion piece of the Grammys, I think is one of the most amusing because people just do goofy things, and they did last night. I have to shout out to Shania Twain for that weirdest outfit I have seen on any red carpet in a while. Uh, Harry Styles, my wife, adores and says that clown couture harlequin jumpsuit was astonishing. Uh, and my favorite was Cardi B's royal blue thing that was just gorgeous. So the, the fashion people come out. But then in terms of the opening number, it was just fun. Bad Bunny did the whole opening thing, and he's a huge monster Latin artist. There was a little bit of controversy because, and this has to do with production, 
Uh, the captions, which we were just talking about, when he was singing in non-English, they captioned it as singing in non-English. And I think the community who needs those captions were a little upset. Why couldn't you have gotten a Spanish language translator to do the captions in Spanish for that massive global audience? So there was a little criticism there, and I think it was well taken. Uh, they did a whole huge hip, 50 years of hip hop thing. That, you know, these are a lot of artists, and the production is incredibly complex. They were doing all sorts of mashups. Uh, Stevie Wonder did a thing. He did Superstition with Chris Stapleton, the huge country artist. Came off flawlessly, and a lot of the show pieces were really, really really good. I thought overall, yeah, it was too long, um, excessive in some places and boring in stretches, but they really tried to do a lot of stuff, including that big close on the rooftop, which seemed to go on forever, but they pulled it off uh, in the middle of a dark, huge rooftop with part of the big nod to hip hop and rap uh, with dozens of artists doing something in unusual circumstances of production. So overall, I give them pretty good grades for pulling off a show. Boring in the middle, yeah, they all are, but I thought it was interesting. Phil, your red carpet rundown has been the highlight of this question. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I love it. We sit there and we, and it, it did from the time I walked into my living room and that's when Harry, uh, no, not Harry Styles. Who was it? Uh, Shania Twain. And I, I didn't even recognize her. And I went, well, who is this? What is this outfit? It'll be all over the place. It was just hysterical and wonderful and goofy and visually interesting. Mitchell. Uh, Bill on uh, E Entertainment Online, too. Uh, my comment is, uh, and I stay in touch with a lot of uh, radio guys, too much reverb on the performances. It was, like, really noticeable. And Alex. Oh. Anyway, so um, <laughs> that's all I have to say. From a production perspective, uh, a couple things. Um, the... They're really into the LED walls. I get it. Um, the grain in the LED walls is it was a little problematic for me, and and you could see them. They it, they're pretty high pitch LED walls, so those are pretty expensive ones. It it wasn't horrible, so you didn't see Marae, but you know it just I hate seeing the texture of LEDs. Like I just hate it, and I don't think it belongs on broadcast television. It's fine for people to be in a, in a live environment, but if I can see the LEDs, then it shouldn't be there. <laughs> like and, and that's a that's a function of being able to, if they're that close to the LEDs, they were pretty close. They had a short stage. If they're that close to the LEDs, use use you know Super Thirty Five instead of you know two thirds inch chips, um, and uh, and and kind of switch over to that. So you have a softer background. People are just standing there. It's really it's not that hard. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, to to switch over, there's this kind of television approach to things, which is you know I I think that two thirds inch chips are should not be used in production anymore. <laughs> so, so anyway, except for football or really long shots. But um, I don't think that, I think that last year's was better. Like, so the one that was in the kind of the nice little space outside with only a handful of people, the COVID spread or whatever, I thought was considerably better than having a huge stadium of people. Like, I don't think that improved the quality of the show for the people who were watching, which was 99% of the viewers. Um, I don't think it improved their, their experience um, at all. Um, so I, you know, I thought that the, the last one felt much more intimate and much more, you know, kind of, they had kind of, and you thought, oh, maybe they're going to do something cool from now on. But the answer was no. Um, the, the actual animation for, and, and again, the LED walls also just feel a little, um, artificial. So I get that they get to do a lot of things and it's really flexible, but there's something about having real sets and real things and that feels more grand and the artificial kind of cheapens the experience in my opinion, or the LEDs make it cheapen the experience. The, um, how many times can they go to, uh, Ben Affleck and, and JLo? Like, I, I was just curious because I was only skipping through it for this, for this answer this morning. And I, I was able to, over a three hour show, as I skipped through, I just kept on seeing them come over and over and I was like, of Ben Affleck really not wanting to be there and, and having a camera smashed into his face the whole time, which was, I just don't understand the editor, um, you know, related to that. The, um, uh, and finally the animations for the awards, of the award spinning in was done by an intern. Like, like it was like, it, it, it must have been done by an intern because it was just, you could see the polygons. You could see the polygons in the shading. Like it wasn't even, it was it, it felt like they just didn't even finish it. <laughs> like, like I was, when I saw it, I was like everything else, I was like, ah, you know, and then I saw that and, and it was painful to look at. Like it, it literally was, um, I mean, it, as a CG artist, that was an embarrassment. Like, like, you know, again, I, I have, 
I've had students that would have done a better job than that. I mean, I mean, I, and I mean, like first three weeks of their of learning how to do 3D, they would have done better work. So it it, it was an embarrassment, you know. <laughs> so so anyway, uh, overall, it was otherwise it was an award show. I don't really like award shows. So I I, I so I'm able to look at the thing as as production because I don't care about the rest of it. I just look only at cameras and backgrounds and things. If I I think if I got lost in the actual show, I probably would have noticed as much as I did. Next question. Next question comes to us from Michael Patria in Poland. And he, Michael says, is there a program that makes the image shot with the camera shake slightly as if it were shot from a hand held and not from a tripod? I mean, I shoot a stable image and this adds the effect in post-production. Alex? So um, you'll be tempted to animate the anchor point. So that's the way, the way most people do it is they'll grab the anchor point and jiggle it and try to get something that's shaking. It'll never look right. Um, and so what, uh, what, what I've done in the past I mean, for a long time is you take a camera and you actually zoom in 20 feet away and you put, you put tracking markers on it and you just try to hold on to that, that space and just your breathing and everything else will move it around a little bit. And the longer you push it away, the more dramatic it'll become. Um, you then track those points and reapply that data back to the, um, to the camera that's in your, in your app. And when you do that, you're going to get this organic, it, it, it takes all the machinery that is you and puts it back into the shot. Um, and then you can, ex you can make that bigger so you can amplify that using ma motion math. I'm talking about After Effects, but you can, you can amplify it more, turn it up uh, or turn it down and you'll get more or less of it. But it'll feel much more realistic than, than trying to um, do it by hand. And that's just for handheld, like long like I'm not trying to move around, but I'm just taking a stable shot and I wanted to have something that feels organic that does that, that tracking. And I can't say that I can't with that. <laughs> That's an, that was an old trick of somewhere I used to work. Mitchell? I like Alex's answer better than mine, but uh, when I take it into After Effects, I use the Wiggler. Uh, you can uh, animate the X, Y, and Z axes. And if you apply a little expression to it, you can randomize it. But as Alex says, you gotta be careful that it doesn't look contrived. But yeah, the, the issue with the Wiggler, I, I've used the Wiggler a lot. Um, the issue with the Wiggler is that when you're holding a camera, if I'm holding the camera here, oh, it's really, really thin. Uh, when you're holding the camera here, and the problem is, is you've got a point, which is your wrist here, you've got your elbow, you've got your shoulder, and these are all doing something, and then you're breathing, so you're going up and down. And so in all of these things, there is a, your camera isn't wiggling, it's actually moving there's like a radius that it's that it's moving inside of that is based on the joints that are here and the levers that are the your arm and your hand and your wrist and everything else and by tracking it you're organically capturing that data and then reapplying it back and if you do a wiggler or you animate the animate the center point um it you'll and and, and if you do the tracking that i talked about here you'll notice a dramatic difference <laughs> between the two once you watch the two when you haven't seen the two of them together it seems like they'd be the same but when you actually do that um you'll suddenly feel it'll feel different that's all the other the other thing that you can do is is actually i mean we've tried this and it does work really well is that you do a lock off with a with a monitor and you literally put the tracking markers on it and then you just try to hold it watching the actual thing that you shot i don't think it makes that much that that doesn't make that much difference but it's fun yeah i i agree with the with the wiggler i think that if you apply an expression to the wiggler so that all the things are reacting to each other it becomes more human but uh you're right i like your your original tracking idea next question Bob Sturdivant in San Antonio is up next. He says, thinking of ChatGPT, how comfortable do you feel having it evaluate your company's sensitive code or a script you're writing without it sharing with others? Guy? Yeah, Amazon actually issued a warning to its internal employees on behalf of their attorneys because they said that they were already seeing instances where it was the employees had sent put in code and then the chatbot learned it and now it's giving it and its answers to others. So you got to be really careful about what you're putting in, especially if that's uh, your your big competitor uh, that now invested big money into it. So I'd, I'd be pretty careful if you're if you're a company with sensitive information. Thanks for that guy, because I've seen a lot of programmers just sharing how they've used ChatGPT to like help with some of the code. So that's um, valuable <laughs> insights there. Alex? Yeah, you have to decide whether it's something that's going to be, you know, generally as a blanket statement, companies are going to tell their employees not to use it for coding. 
Um, but the reality is it's so efficient that if you're doing things like, oh, I'm going to do new and how to do a window draw, or I'm going to do something that's relatively vanilla, but you're looking for the most efficient way to do that, or you're looking for a new way to solve that problem, uh, it's an incredible resource. I was just talking to someone yesterday about it, and it just it really um, gives you all kinds of power and speed, um, and it'll come up with ways to do it that are much oftentimes sometimes less elegant, oftentimes way more elegant than what you were going to do. Um, so it saves you a lot of time and effort. You just have to be careful to not put mission critical stuff, you know, into it. Good point. John? Uh, there was this candle maker named Luigi and his friend walked in Mario. He said, hey, Luigi, did you hear about this new thing? It's called electricity. He says, yeah, what are they going to do? Put wires everywhere? These are the Neo-Luddites <laughs> talking. And Keely. I think that that's going to be the next sort of stage that we are looking at the artificial intelligence is the siloing of information because one of the greatest strengths of uh, Chad GPT and such is that they're basically trawling from the entire internet. But that's also its biggest weakness is that with answers that require expertise or maybe a bit of sensitivity, you don't actually want the whole internet. You want actual experts. So I think that'll be part of what comes next, which is the engine and the ability to apply a smaller subset of data inside the artificial intelligence in order to get your answer. And that's where you're going to be able to actually use proprietary or IP protected information within these kind of engines. Next question. Next one comes to us from Chris Widener in Otten Lafayette, Indiana. And Chris says, I have a need for an ultra portable live setup. What would you consider the lowest specs for a 1080 Zoom client, an i5 with 16 megs of RAM for Windows? Does it need more horsepower than that, he wonders? Go ahead, Jason. Uh, you know, it really depends on if you have uh, discrete graphics or whether you're trying to rely on the Intel processor. But I mean, I, I've, let me put it this way. I would never do this without a Mac Mini these days. It is impossible to beat for what it costs. Alex? It depends on whether you need 720p or not. So there's a lot of the the B links or the other things that are really inexpensive that will give you 720p. You need four cores, uh, or it will not give you 1080p. So if you're looking for a 1080p contribution, the Mac Mini is probably the le the $599 or $499 if you're education, I believe, um, is the least expensive solution for a 1080p. So um, right now, or very very close to it, and far far more. I mean, it, it's an I mean. If you buy a 499 or 399 PC, or spend a little bit more on a Mac Mini, the the level of power difference between those is dramatic. Um, so, so I, you know, I think that the, the, that's the highest value right now. But if you're doing 720p, you can probably find a PC that is, um, you know, less than two hundred fifty dollars that'll do do what you need it to do. Next question. Douglas Carmichael up next. Alex, you mentioned grain on LED walls. Would that be a characteristics of a characteristic of the processing feeding the wall or the design of the panels themselves? It's the panels themselves. So this has to do with the pitch. There is a there is basically an interaction between the distance that the subject has to the screen, the size of the sensor, how far you're zooming in, and your and the pitch of the wall. Um, those were probably those that wall. I'm gonna guess was like a 1.7, 1.9 pitched wall. Um, so if you get down, you can get lower than that, which is really expensive. So you can get down to a 0.9, a 1.2, um, and then if you pulled, if they had just done that, which would have been expensive, um, and they or they just moved that that person standing in front of it further away. On some of the wider shots, you saw a lot less of the problem. Um, you know, so the wider shots weren't weren't as problematic in some of the close ups where the screen is further back. Um, looked a little artificial, but it wasn't it wasn't uh, as as bad. And when I say grain, it's really the texture of that. And and as a live person, the other thing that happens is it destroys live encoding to have that texture back there. Um, so we're really sensitive to it. But I just don't like the look. Like I just feel like it's artificial. Um, I think that if they just had moved the speakers, like for most of the announcements, if they had moved the speakers 15 feet forward, so they just made the, the, the they have a huge stadium and they did a short stage, which was crazy. <laughs> so, so anyway, so if they had pulled them 15 or 20 feet away from the, uh, uh, from that background and then shot, that probably would have been enough, even with two thirds inch ca uh, cameras to get rid of all that texture because it'll fall into the bokeh. And so then now it's going to, and now it's all going to nice and be smooth and buttery and will look great. So you can do that with LED walls. You just need to 
think about them a little bit. And we've spent time in warehouses with multiple, with with pitched, like here's a 1.2, here's a 1.9, here's a 2.3, 3.2, you know, like we go up and we see what distance do we have to be at, what sensor size, what zoom. And we've literally done it with little, little um, you know, one by one panels all sitting next to each other so we could figure out where we needed to put a person and where, and if you're doing a show this big, that's what you do. <laughs> you, know, you, sit in, you sit in a warehouse and you, and you calculate where, where those cameras are going to be and you figure out whether the, that pitch is going to disappear into the bokeh or not. And it just didn't feel like they did that or they didn't care. Guy? Yeah, yesterday, Peter Rosado had put a link in for a church that uh, had a video wall and uh, they had nine red Komodos. And in the video, the gentleman says uh, they tried Sony's Panasonic's Canon's and they love Canon's and they're about ready to do a bunch of C500s. And then for kicks, they tried the red Komodo and because it has a global shutter, he said the video wall just looked amazing. Every So it's one of those churches that also had satellite locations and the people at the other end were like, wow, what are you guys doing? Because it looks so much better. So they swapped over to all these cameras with global shutters, which was really fascinating because I'm looking at the UE-160s, which says that they have some some new technology going into those that you can uh, uh, work with the more patterns and whatnot. So uh, I'd, I'd be looking at uh, other cameras that have a global shutter of that is indeed what you'll be right. doing, at least run a test. It's interesting. I've never seen a global shutter make a difference. I mean, if, if the cameras are gen locked, if they didn't gen lock them, then the, then the, the global shutter makes a big difference. So, so if they're not gen locked, it, you know, if, if you're using ungen locked cameras, you'd actually absolutely have a problem with it. Um, it's also the, um, there's a high pass filter or low pass filter that's in, um, uh, low pass filters. It's in some cameras and not black magic ones that make them less sensitive to the, to the Murray as well. Next question. Douglas Carmichael up next. He says the Blue Sona mic has a built-in clear amp, phantom-powered preamp, despite it being a dynamic mic. Has anyone had any experience with it? And would an inbuilt preamp have risks for adding noise before he goes into his console? Alex? Yes. <laughs> like you're, you're, you have a mic doing a cheap, the, the most important part of your microphone other than the, than the pickup is the, is the preamp. Like the preamp is everything. And so having a great preamp, you want to be able to adjust that preamp. You don't usually want that to be in the, in the mic. I think that would be not something that I'd, I'd want to do. Next question. Chris Widener back from Lafayette, Indiana. Again, this time he asks, rumors of an iPhone ultimate edition abound. Thoughts on what they'd add? To make it ultimate. Alex. Uh, the rumor is they're going to add the Ultra and Max processors. And so they'll be able to do, the, you know, the you know, you're really getting to a point where the iPhone is a camera. You know, like it is. The thing to remember is that, you know, a vast majority of people consider the primary feature of their uh, phone to be the camera. You know, and so whatever the camera can do is how they measure the quality of their phone. Everything else is like whatever, you know, and so um, so for, for most people. And so the the two things there will be able to be processing AR and VR, which will be more important in 24. You know, so what that processing speed means is that you'll be able to build AR and VR experiences or AR experiences for your phone that are using 10, 20, 30 times more polygons and bigger textures and everything else than you would be. Able. So they'll be able to say, well, this experience is really great if you have the ultra. Um, it may have to be a lower resolution version if you have the regular one. So, you know, we're moving towards like right now, we consider when we're developing AR stuff, we consider 2 million polygons about the right number for phones over the last three or four years. And so if you go below that, above that, you start seeing frame loss at iPhone 10s. Um, and, uh, but if you, but you can go to a, up to 10 million in the current, so what if we could put a hundred million polygons in there or, you know, hundred million polygons and tons of texture maps and everything else, it's just going to look a lot better. So as Apple gets more and more, um, focused on AR, as there's 3d being projected and tracked into the camera, there is no limit to the power that you need in the camera. <laughs> like it's just, you're just gonna, you're going to compromise things based on what the, what the phone can do. And so, um, so they, you know, they could put the new M3s, you know, with ultras into the, into the phone and we could still tap it out if we wanted, if, you know, for, to do what we're trying to do. And that I was just bringing in some of the comments and Joe said, yes, an, an M3 and heat dissipation. Um, Chris says, I just want it to take the Canon lenses. I am right there with you, <laughs> right there with you. you know, we Chris. talked about that for only 15 years of like, we, and Sony tried one and they tried one where you could mount a camera on the front. Um, and it just never quite turned the corner. And there was the, the, the DXO camera, which I have five in a box somewhere. Um, and, uh, those were all like, you could attach it 
you could attach it to a one inch sensor, which still looks better than the current the current iPhone's um, sensor. But you just couldn't get people to enough people to buy them to to make them make sense. And Bill. I'd love to be able to put the 70 to 200 Canon on the front of my phone. That would be a fun look. Uh, but in seriousness, I wonder if they're thinking also of doing something to really upscale the display, not in size, but they're doing so much with OLED and things like that, that who knows what magic, now that they've got HDR and all these other things, they can build behind the screen to make it a seriously beautiful and capable monitor now that we're shooting in this Rec 2020 and things like that. That'd be fun. Next question. Uh, Douglas Carmichael says, Alex, you mentioned that the use of virtual sets cheapened the experience. With the power and flexibility of XR, wouldn't it open up many more doors and be more environmentally friendly versus expensing, expensive, time-consuming set fabrication if they could get it done well? Sure. <laughs> yes, I, it still cheapens the experience. Like, like I, I didn't, I didn't say that they, that, you know, that, that that they shouldn't pick that or or do whatever. But I feel like it cheapens the experience, and I think that part of it is is that in general, the computer graphics last night were pretty abysmal. So the graphics that they were putting on the LED walls was also pretty cheap. And I think it probably it might have looked better if they had if they had spent more more of their budget on. Uh, on the actual graphics because the graphics for the awards were horrible and the the screen was a lot of them were just okay you know like they 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 they, they didn't really reach um, for the level but if you yeah, if you put um you know mandalorian level stuff back there had a higher pitch screen and moved it 10 feet back i may not say that <laughs> you know i may be like wow that was amazing um that you could do all those things it's it, it the technology is all there to do it right they they just didn't do it right last night. That's all. Next question. Joe Kidd at Bay Area, California says, could you guesstimate the pitch of the LED walls found in some of the larger Apple retail stores? Alex? If I were going to guess, I'd say 1.7 or 1.9. Next question. Uh, Liberty White, Toronto, Ontario. Has anyone, uh, I was invited to produce a virtual program for students ages 10 to 14 on content creation to get them interested in STEAM. Uh, what would you introduce them to to get them career ready? And just context, so science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And there was such a great conversation yesterday um, on Sunday for like apps and all of that. So I'm like thinking like Swift Playground would be helpful from them. Anything VR um, related, of course, gaming. And just thinking, you know, if they're 10 to 14, they'll be looking at what in the next five years they'll be looking at different programs to go on to university and college and so if we're planting seeds for them now what that should look like for them alex i would say that so unity is easier to learn unreal is a little bit harder to learn um, but unreal is a lot more scalable and it's used in a lot more places um, and it has i think that the, some of the uh, starter assets for unreal and the marketplace are a lot better than unity's and so i think that if i was going to have kids in this month, at this moment, um, I would have uh, kids learn Unreal and build, like, build a game. You know, because you can, my son sat down and followed a tutorial and had a, a, uh, a game running in, like, four hours. You know, so, so you know, without any, anybody talking to him. <laughs> you know, and there's, a, there's actually, Marin County has a lot of crazy things that people spend money on. And there's an XR for kids. There's actually an XR... Um, stage that's been paid for i don't even think i don't know if it costs anything for them to go learn how to do it um and they have a bunch of headsets now i think they're using unity because again it's easier to build build things faster uh if i was going to do it next year i probably would not build my curriculum until mid-june Ooh, okay. So I would I would probably wait for everything to all the, the there, announcements and everything. There's this there's this thing called WWDC uh, <laughs> that happens in June, in early June, and um and we we I we don't know anything. I don't know anything. I don't have any inside information, but there's a lot of rumors that Apple's about to build a lot of tools that make it easy to build. Um, you know, they've been building the tools: AR Creator, uh, AR Converter, I mean, or um, Reality Creator, Reality Converter. There's a lot of things happening in that space right now. Um, my guess is, is that when it comes out, it's going to be a lot more approachable than what the current systems are because Apple fake focuses more on how to make it easy to generate content. Um, so uh, following all the rumors that we're looking at, that we think we're going to get an AR set and that Apple is working on things to make it easier, the place that they would announce it would be WWDC. 
So I would probably wait until mid June to see what Apple does, and then if they don't do anything, then then go back to Unreal <laughs> or okay. or Unity. But those are the those are the the big ones right now. Okay, yeah, the program's next month, but yeah. we successfully do this. I will be looking at that <laughs> for yeah. the next. But, but time look at look at the marketplace and the training that's available on Re Unreal because it's Unreal. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's it, it is a lot. There are so many places to do that, and of course, we have a great expert in educating in Unreal, uh, Nick Joshishin. So. Uh, He's always a person to write, reach out to for that kind of thing. And you could probably bring him in as a guest to, you know, to, to show stuff as well. I'm sure he'd, he'd jump right in. Thank you. Next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When launching campaigns aimed at clients or potential employees or partners, what friction or sorting criteria allows you to surface the most qualified, serious, or otherwise attention-worthy applicants? Alex? I, I'm, I'm trying to... Oh, okay. Well, I mean... The, the main thing that I'm always looking for is I try to find ways to do things with people. <laughs> so I, I want to, um, you know, office hours for me is like one giant, you know, lab in that area where I get to see who people are based on what they do every week, not um, what they're going to say or what, you know, how, I'm, how they're going to do it in an interview. I, we, we have done a lot of training over the last 20 years and we find that people who do well in interviews and people who do well um, in tests and everything else don't necessarily translate to people who do well in the job. <laughs> you know, the, 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 there's not a one-to-one -one relationship there. Um, and so finding people and getting, finding ways to do that. So that can be doing lots of tests, doing partnerships, doing, um, uh, but also we, a lot of people we put in, we put them into non you know, non-critical positions first and just see what happens. Like, do they show up on time? Do they get things done? Do they, are they accountable? How, do, how are they out with the team? And then they slowly, we give them more more responsibility over time um, as we as we see how they how they operate with the weight that we keep on adding to them slowly. We try not, not to hire, to hire people, people into high. high um, and I'm getting just a little, a little bit. bit I'm getting, getting myself, myself back, back suddenly. suddenly. Um, no, so uh, I want to. Anyway, next question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> next question. Next one comes to us from uh, Wayne Ma in Park City, Utah. And he asks, Coldplay performed on Saturday Night Live with a group of 40-plus singers, all of them with wireless handheld mics. How did they do that? Oh, Alex. Uh, really good uh, wireless uh, management, most likely Axion. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, sure, Axion is is the kind of the if you're doing big broadcast, it's, and it absolutely positively has to work for uh, you know an industrial style. I mean, not industrial but broadcast. Uh, my guess is Axion. Um, you could definitely put forty channels on it. So I think that that's that'd be my guess. Um, it's it's pretty incredible when it comes to doing infrastructure style uh, events like that. Yeah, Mickey says in the in the comments, 40 channels of RF is not difficult at all given proper RF planning and coordination, especially given the relatively controlled and confined space. So definitely doable. Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. And Douglas says, Mitch, how do you like the Blue Compass boom arm? I'm thinking of it myself for either a Blue Santa, uh, Sona, or Earthworks Icon Pro Mic. Go ahead, Mitchell. Well, the first thing I like about it is it's streamlined. You can't see it very well here behind me. It's uh, holding up that uh, U87 behind my head. If I lean back, you can see a little bit better. But uh, pluses on it, um, streamlined, inexpensive, no springs that I can see anyhow. And I don't hear them either, which also makes it good. So I would say a U87 would be right at the edge of being too heavy for it. Thank you so much, Mitchell. All right. Well, thank you so much to our producers for the first round of, of questions as we get ready to hit the top of the hour and get into our conversation with Doc Rock of Ecamm and talking all things online community management and, of course, Ecamm. Go ahead and submit your questions for our second hour so that we can, as the panelists and everyone, get prepared. And just a little bit of a backstory of even being able to like bring Doc Rock on was earlier this year, each day we were brainstorming. So we had different shows on brainstorming for second hour topics. But in after hours, there was a conversation conversation that took place just about connecting, like how to build an international. So Office Hours is a, a global community, but for those who have virtual, e produce virtual events or internally the organization where you work, how do you really build that connectivity that not only in your local area, but then building an international audience? And it was like the light bulbs went off and it's like, 
Doc Rock, not only for those of you who may know him, I'm going to bring him to the stage momentarily so he can give us more of his origin stories. But in, not only is he inside of an organization like ECAM, but then even what he does and what he's been doing for years in community building. Doc Rock, thank you so much for joining us here on Office Hours. How are you today? Good, good. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be here and uh, happy birthday. Let me oh, know. <laughs> thank you so much. So let's let's start with your origin stories of because I do this all the time with guests and just going and you've you've been in the space, been on YouTube um, for a long time and constantly serving, which uh, I'm not taking that away, but I'll constantly serving being a key to community building where where did you start um so my mom and dad and then there was a 60 cent <laughs> never mind um so i actually i guess part of it was when i got out of the military i was a paramedic in the military hence the name um i always liked the triage side of things so i got into tech from the fact that i got to continue doing triage but i didn't have to work in the hospital anymore working in the hospital was was starting to get to me um and i i was already doing tech stuff from my music side you know djing and working in studio and you know doing stuff like that and so in that process once your friends find out that you're the nerd Hey, can you help me do this? Hey, can you help me do that? So way back in the very beginning of all of this, one of my friends saw a like revision three show and was like, I want to make a show like that. Can you help me? And because my family owns an electronic store and I'm the resident computer nerd, I got stuck with both and, and trying to help them put together a show. I fell in love with it and been here ever since. That's amazing. So we have the, of course, birth, <laughs> but then just being the resident, the resident geek and tech person. Can we dive into this conversation about community and, and like your secret sauce for building community? How do you even begin to approach that? Well, the first thing it probably helps if you're the uh, only male in the household with seven women and you're the baby. Um, I had my my sisters and my mom and my auntie and my grandmother, and I was by myself. So I had to have friends. <laughs> so when I got into doing the uh, stuff online, I was used to trying to get people to come be with me so I didn't have to be with them. And <laughs> I think that's just part of it is like I'm a genuinely curious person. I, I really do enjoy people. I like meeting people and, you know, learning from them and being able to assist them in any way I can. So my community, this sounds so crazy. Uh, my community made me build it. I was mm -hmm. kind of minding my business and doing my live shows. And they were like, we need a place to hang out. That's not when you're live. And I was like, okay. So I had this secret scroll Facebook room that was like me, my brother, a couple of my friends. And then they just bombarded and told everybody, here's the link. I found Doc Secret's Facebook room. And then they, they all just came over. And like within a matter of days, people started dragging other people. And we got up to about like seven, 800 users in probably like a week. And I was like, thanks, guys. Now that you snitched, I have to work. <laughs> so after that, I can tell you the, the most important thing to do right away, which I did in at first, was you need to define like your clear purpose what are you going to do with this like what are your values right and when you can do that first you can eliminate all other sorts of drama right i think that's something that's been done really well here is there's a clear purpose and clear values so it keeps the shenanigans at bay but that's that's probably on, on my friend alex over there <laughs> you know that's that's part of the old army guy routine we yeah man we, we come in and set, we set camp as we call it, you know. <laughs> and so what I heard from you is that there there was a need. So your the community and uh, unofficial community at the time was like, is there some way that we can connect that's not live? And so you you saw the need first and then did something about it. And then pe the right people found you. Yes, I think a lot of two things about community. I think people forget to make one. And then I think people sometimes jump too early 
and then start to get the feelings because there's nobody there. There's nothing wrong with starting it first. Let's just clear that up. You can start it first right away, but you can't have any feelings about it. You got to work from, you know, actual facts. And as you start to do stuff that you can do in your productions or in your podcast, even in your newsletter, you can develop the community in the products that you produce. However, you I wouldn't say build one right away and then start feeling bad because there's you and your you know family member in there. That's going to happen. That's like every business that requires external customers. It starts out with a small group of people. You know, there used to be two Apple computers. One at Steve's house and well, both of them at Steve's house. <laughs> but, you know, now look, right? But you know what I'm saying? So you you have you have to get that part out of your head and I don't think there's anything wrong with starting ahead of time and knowing that this is what you want to do, but then you go out and find the right people to fit that comes in. And don't assume that the right people is everybody because you can definitely generate some problems for yourself if the people that you bring to your community don't kind of fit. I want to say a mold because you want to be open, but you also got to understand that certain people are just not built for community. Mm, that's a, a good it's a very a good tough point. one so being okay that it doesn't what's the saying you can't you can't be all things to all people essentially that's correct that's correct now how did you make your way into like the ecam world and then to to be that point person to help with the community development there uh, actually, that is a fantastic question, and this is one of the ways that you can help yourself build a community. Let's say something new comes out and you absolutely love it. Like um, a friend of mine did the same thing with Discord. <laughs> so if you if you find a product that you absolutely love, you go into their community, and at first you sit there like a fly on the wall, and you observe and you see what the temperature in the room is, if you will, right? So I'm watching the temperature in the room. You're kind of seeing what's going on. And then I started hearing questions, questions that I fully knew the answer to, questions I knew how to answer, and I could be helpful and assistive in some way. So what I would do is I would create videos that would assist the questions because it's easier. Anybody seen me type before? Trust me, make the video. <laughs> My <laughs> typing is atrocious. So what I would do is I would make these videos to explain to someone um, the reason why your white balance looks funny is because you don't have a white balance checker. Go get one. <laughs> like, it's really important. Take your camera off of auto white balance. Or if you're using a Sony, the, the mic delay is always five frames. It's just what it is, or four frames, sorry. It's what it is. It's never going to go away. Something about the way the cam link and, you know, Sony's work. Or these are the cameras that work with USB, right? Because I had a bunch in my office, so I tested all of these Sonys. And then we built an official list. And so eventually the developers are like, oh, there's a list with all these cameras that work via USB. Um, where can I get that list? And they're like, what list? And it's like, oh, here's a Google Drive link, but I want to know if there's a, you know, if this camera's on there. And they're like, hey, did you create this list? Yeah. Oh, thanks. All right, cool. Um, I, I noticed all your, your videos. Um, we should talk. I was like, okay, cool. And one day Katie called me and says, uh, we want to like, sponsor your show or you know find some way to work with you and be honest with you guys i didn't know what the answers were to sponsor the show as much times as i've sat with alex on the other program that we were on together i never asked those questions i just come in have fun you know goof off say dumb stuff on the internet and then i feverishly started googling uh how, how what did you do for a sponsor on your show like what is the right rate and and I was like, ah, uh, this is frustrating. So anyway, I just kept doing what I was doing, which probably looked like I was playing hard to get, but I just didn't know the answer. So I was parlaying it, and I was doing some woodworking stuff at the time. And then I guess they had a company meeting, and the tech support team was like, yo, we're getting hammered, and we're growing really fast. We need to find somebody like Doc that could help us out. And then the owner was like, why don't you just ask Doc? And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so the my direct boss, Katie, she called me up. And then she's like, hey, so instead of sponsoring show, what if you just come and work for us? I was like, what does that look like? And they're like, you do whatever you're doing right now, but you just work for us. So you do it. What we need is we take priority. Done. Right when everybody else was running into, like, job problems, I was like, absolutely, I'll take it. And then I sold my 
my laser engraving and CNC business probably like two weeks later. That is awesome because I don't know if you're aware of this, but like our Monday conversations are typically that that in between of like the content, the digital production, but also the the business side. And you as a creator, a technologist, and then having the the crossover happen with the oh wait they want to sponsor, and then oh no, bringing you in. And the other part that you tied together was Alex says all the time on office hours, like just show up, just show up and serve, and that people will begin to to see you and you know answering questions and how much of an impact that that will have uh, on you but then also the people I apologize these are these birthday <laughs> calls coming in <laughs> Alex you have a, a question comment for Doc you know both of us believe a lot in community and and one of the I'm curious for you when you think about the key aspects of building a community what are the like the linchpins that you just have to do you know to build to build up your community okay i actually remember these and it's funny it's the thing that you know in your head but i made sure i wrote them down so i don't forget any of them uh I already just I already mentioned you want to define your purpose. I think purpose is super important. I think um, uh, as Keely could probably tell you, I talk ad nauseum about finding your purpose. Without your purpose, you're just going to have problems. And I I I have a saying that purpose is an analgesic, right? For all of the people right now, and this is a big conversation, and I know people get really mad at me, but I say. I kind of don't really believe in creative burnout. What happens is you start hard charging at what you thought you wanted to do. You got right in the middle of it and decided you didn't want to really do that. And there goes the burnout. But if you're going on your purpose, you know what that is? It's a different thing. It's like, you know what it's like to be in the middle of a mission and they go, oh, that's not the mission. We want to do this other mission. And we were like, what? <laughs> so I think purpose is super important. Um, then you want to find ways to foster that engagement. So, a lot of people are just turning on and they sit there. I ask questions. All right, guys, what is it that you want to know? What is it that you're stuck on? What is your number one pain point right now? Right? So you did that with this show, right? Everybody all of a sudden got forced into having to do this. And with, with, without that, we wouldn't have a show. <laughs> like, exactly. Like literally, that's what right? we call our viewers, the, the the producers, is because they're the producers. Like they tell us what they want to talk about every single morning. It's, exactly. So when you when you let people tell you what they want, it's so much easier. Um, anybody who's married, you kind of know this, but you might just be stubborn about it. <laughs> okay. And then you want to have uh, what is the best best way to say this? You want to have clear rules for moderation that I didn't do at first. And then I kind of figured it out as I was going along. And then I had help from Keely and other friends that's like, yo, we should make it more definitive so that way people aren't lost. People feel better. It's kind of like um, when you first, when, when puppies are first born, like if you hold them tighter, they're actually more relaxed. Is, or babies when you swallow them. In a way, it's the same thing for all humans. If they understand the direction and stuff like that, you just get better outcomes, right? And then I think the next one is probably the biggest. You want to offer them as many tools for success as you can. And so I would do things like uh, let's work on helping people divine, define their purpose. Let's work on helping people discover their goals, right? Let's work on helping people get to those goals or understanding what type of YouTube metrics you should really pay attention to and not what everybody else thinks they are, right? Bursting any, you know, weird thought bubbles around there's a lot of noise in my space, right? And there's also in any space that's growing, any space where there's money or opportunity, you get a lot of charlatans and I don't want to call any of them out, but I can tell people what to look for, right? I was like, this is what you look for. If you eat, The minute you hear this word, they're not trying to help you. They're trying to help them, right? So things like that, that you know, was sort of what I went into. And I think the number one thing, uh, Liberty already said this, you got to be present. You just got to show up. And so I started offering a week, strangely enough, a weekly Zoom meeting for us to get together and hang out and just, you know, air our laundry. And that eventually changed to Discord because Keely. That's so awesome because it it what you shared too in in that breakdown. I I heard an, uh, on an interview or, or it might have been one of your Q and A's 
is that like the niching, not niching down because that's a double negative, but like specific up. And by being able to do that, just how the, not only drawing the community, but you specifically. And one of the things that you do really well is the the technology information, but then also what else, like how else can I support them with wellness or mental health or your goal setting and bringing all of that, um, all of that to the table. And we're going to get to some of the, the questions I see them piling up here. Um, shortly. And if the panel, if you've got any questions for Doc, feel free to to raise your hand there. Um, and then like, if we can take a moment to just even going into the mentoring aspect, like, as you said, you've created a space for other creators to, um, to come together. What has been successful um, for you? Like, because when you teach, you also get something back. Oh, goodness. A hundred percent. Okay. So <clears throat> I can tell you, and again, just happens to randomly be one of the highlights for me. So anyway, number one, happy birthday, Keely. And number two, I'm doing a speaking gig. And in my speaking gig, the um, producer said, do you know anybody else we should reach out to? And I go, you know, I've been doing a lot with my community and stuff like that. And he goes, yeah, that's what you're going to talk about. <clears throat> I go, well, I can bring on a person who helped me redefine my community and get it off of Facebook because Facebook was getting a little messy at the time and move it into Discord. And he goes, I want to move mine into Discord. Who? And I was like, okay, let me introduce you to Keely. So when the the conference came around and we're we're sitting there and it was her turn to speak. I'm always the closer. So she got to speak before me. I set myself up. I should have switched that. Um, <laughs> I watched some of the YouTubers who I looked up to when I was building what I was building, sit there and listen to her talk on the edge of their seat. In most of the other conversations, it was they heard what they heard before. So they're kind of doing their own thing, cavorting with themselves, having fun. But they were engaged. They were asking her questions and maybe even trying to stump her. <laughs> and she just like, Psst. I, I play with a hockey stick, I, you know, and she she cleaned it. And I'm sitting back and I was like, it's one of my people, you know, like, so I was in the corner, like, you know, feeling like Big Papa because I watched her and another one of our creators, um, another girl named Gigi, and they did so well in their thing. And I was like, wow, I never would have thought that the people that I originally had in my Zoom meetings or my Facebook group would be out here leading their own things and growing. Of course, that's what I wanted. That's part of my mission. It's written in stone in my mission. But to see it come to fruition, like, I wait, I'm going to actually start tearing a little bit. But I think that was one of my highlights of last year is watching uh, Keely and Gigi talk, watching some of my other friends, you know, grow. And then recently, uh, another one of my, you know, real close people, India, she just started doing some big things on her own. And I just think it's cool that, you know, we're sort of able to pass the torch, if you will. That's awesome. All right, Bill, let's get into these questions. Absolutely. First one comes from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. And Chris says, Doc, you rock. Love your testing streams. Uh, do you feel like those build as much audience engagement as the regular live topic streams? It really seems from the outside, at least, that those start as good, if not better, conversations. I definitely believe in... You have to be willing to show some of your vulnerability. And the way to do that is when I'm doing the streams that aren't really, I won't say they're not important because I think every every piece of practice you put in is a purpose is important because we practice on purpose. You shouldn't just willy-nilly practice. You don't get anything out of it, right? If you went to the basketball court and you dribbled and you threw to the left of the board every time, you're not going to get good at shooting. So when you shoot, you try to aim for that little orange thing in the middle of the big white board. That's just how you do it, right? So I do practice on purpose, but I also believe that coming in and telling everybody, hey, vulnerability's down, you can ask whatever you want. I'm going to do some dumb stuff here, say some dumb stuff here. It gives you a chance to get better in your skill. It gives your audience a chance to understand that you are human and you are approachable. So, yes, thank you for coming to my definitely unformulated shows. And I, I think they're do really well at helping you grow community because I'm a strong believer that people are tired of gurus. People want to find people like them that they can actually reach and attain. So 
it's even if you're only 20% out of software, right? So for right now, I'm doing a lot of streams talking about Mid Journey. I just started Mid Journey like two weeks ago. And I'm deep into it now, like a like psycho, like it's pretty obsessive. But the people that are starting now, they could catch me in two weeks, right? So that's more approachable than trying to catch somebody who's way down the lane. And so I think that level of vulnerability is super important. Yeah, and that's what they say. You really just need to be a few steps ahead to be able to help and, and teach someone else. And for them to see, oh, well, I've watched Doc for two weeks do this. Like, I can dive in. That that speaks volumes for the, the human connection. Keely? Yeah, thanks, Doc, for all those kind words earlier, by the way. Uh, one of the things that Doc and I have been working on and we've been experimenting with is using off social uh, areas in order to do some of the more um, maybe uh, rough <laughs> communications or rough testing. So that's one of the examples of something that you can do in a Discord. And you can take your community that you have around you in YouTube and be talking about a particular topic. But if you want to do something that's maybe even more interactive, that just doesn't play well with the algorithm or look th the way that you want it to come across on social media, you can then pull that into a, a Discord community, jump into a voice channel and do something that is is even more uh, experimental and feel feel it's a safe space, not just for you, but also for all the members of your community to dive back in. You can continue that dialogue, continue the learning, find out more things that you people need, and then turn that around and make that into a more polished product to go back pardon me, out onto social. So that's that's one of the, the beauties of having, you know, that flow between the two areas. And what, even with what you've shared there, that also speaks to just the ability of adding different offerings to the community. Like being part, part of being a part of this Discord community is you get that behind the scenes, you get that raw, uncut part of it and it just makes it it able you able to have more I guess offerings without putting the dollar sign to it but like services and offerings and for the community would you say that doc like by being 100%. able to do those things 100 percent. I think one of the other things and this is also a challenge for people is this is going to be hard to say because it sounds weird but it's so true you want to be giving more than it's worth but at the same token you want to make sure that you make it sustainable for you. Okay. So if, if you're going to give these offers and things like that, you want to make it almost a no brainer that when you decide to go to a paid offering that they'll be happy to be there. Like they want to be there. And again, my community said, Hey dude, we're, we're tired of just taking stuff from you. We want to pay you. Like, how can we pay you? They told me to turn on the membership. And so again, now Discord is so easy to set up a membership. Um, it, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty incredible. But there's many ways to do this, many of networks that are available to you. But when you've done the, the giving uh, enough times to where it's starting to become, say, like a second job for you, make sure you have yourself in a position where you can offer a paid offering and you'd be surprised that people are just waiting for you to do that. And I was taken aback by that. That really threw me for a loop. But... Once you do that, now you, you just make sure you give more than you think it's worth uh, because there's so many places that don't do that. And I I think that maybe that's from my Apple days. I might be from my military days. It might just be from my mama. Like we've always been service oriented folk. You know what I mean? Like she would always offer me to cut somebody else's grass for them without telling me. <laughs> <laughs> Alex. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, when I was listening to you, it, that I, you know, very much try to do is that interactivity reduces the the technical load of what you need to produce to keep people happy, <laughs> I find. You know, so if we have a place for them to go, if we're listening, like in this show, we're taking questions, we're interacting with the audience, we're using Discord, we have a lot of other things that are all there. But the big thing there is that it it is, um, you know, if I try to do a video, like I had to do a video for Leo yesterday, 
I, it took me a long time <laughs> to be happy with the video. And I, I wasn't even, I, it wasn't that I was happy with it when I sent it to Leo. I was like, well, I don't have any more time. I have to, I have to just send this in or he won't have it on the show. And, and so, and it was like two or three hours that I just dumped into like a eight minute video. And for me, it's much easier to get up and have a conversation, you know, with, with the audience and, and with, and with our members to, to, you know, talk to them. And I think it's oftentimes we, like what we covered in the first hour here is way more than we, than it would have taken me days or weeks to produce that much content that quickly. So I, I, I you know, do you, do you focus more on, on the, on that interactivity than you do on, on building like kind of built videos? I like, actually, I'll be dead honest. I hate building the built videos yeah, now. Yeah. I prefer, you know what it is something about uh, Alex and you know, this It's something about watching a person's face light up when you know, they caught exactly the minute that you were explaining. Yeah. And you can do that in a room like this, right? We could do that in our discord rooms. We could do that in other community oriented rooms. When I put the video out there, I put it out there and I got to wait for the comments to come in. And nowadays, most of the comments are weird bots. <laughs> so it's it's not the same. Like, I just, I, maybe it's a Tinkerbell complex or whatever, right? Like, I, I enjoy watching someone's face light up. Um, oftentimes, like, I'll make fun of my members that make weird faces in the middle of, of explaining something. Because if you get the RCA dog tilt, okay, I got to re-explain that. You know, I right. got to change that. And my community is real good at catching me for using too many technical terms. And so it's made my video production better because now I understand not to throw in thing like a luff. I have to explain to them, oh, I mean, it's loudness under full scale. And they're still, okay. So um, it's the, it's K-weight. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like I would explain it the way that I would explain it to you. And they're looking at me like, nah, man, nah, what are you talking about? And then you got to go in and explain it further, right? So that's a, yeah, I, I think you're 100% correct. I love showing up for those because it makes the production side better. I think my videos have gotten better because of my community. Awesome. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael again. He says, how did you build community around a product? How do you build community around a product when the product may not be a dominant force in its market? We are definitely, we are the baby. Most people don't even know we exist. And when they find out, they go, why did I not know that? Um, there's a three-letter word I'm not, that I don't say too often. That is the dominant force in our industry uh, because it's free. <laughs> so, you know, that's just always going to be the case. However, um, if you really don't have to do that, like, um, how do I explain this? I worked at Apple when we were nowhere near the dominant force in the industry. So I think maybe I just learned it from corporate culture, right? If you make a good product and you show up and you, we keep saying be present, maybe that's the theme. You show up and you give more than the value that it's supposed to, no matter what people say about you. Um, you try to make sure that you are offering people a place where they can come in and grow and ask the questions that they want to ask without feeling somehow left behind, it will just happen. Like it's, it's hard to say this in, in a straight face, but it will just happen. So you do not have to be the dominant force. As a matter of fact, some of the things that we all love to this day used to be the lowest on the totem pole and they no longer are that. That's such a good point. So not even focus on where you are, but again, just back to that service first aspect of things. I like that analogy that you put with Apple because Apple wasn't the the most it was dominant. A laughing stock, you know. Take the, remember, sell your stock and give back all the money. Like you know, sometimes you need one of those resets though in order to find your groove. Next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Chris says engagement gets talked about here a lot, but it always comes down to draw them to your platform of choice. What do you see as the key to meeting the audience halfway? Mm, I, okay, so my audience was heavy Facebook. I, not a fan, and it was getting really messy, and I wasn't a fan of, you know, only 720 you know, things like that, like that. Sorry, that's just me. Right. So I like I wanted to get everybody to YouTube. And so I just started doing my thing. And once I got, you know, enough people coming to my show and I saw that my audience was kind of like 75 Facebook and 25 YouTube, most people would have 
just gave up and gone to the Facebook route. But I explained to them why the YouTube route was better. I explained to them that one of the most frustrating things for you right now is I'm in the middle of talking and then somebody texts you and then you have to switch over to that text message and I'm gone now. When you come back, it takes a second to load. You missed all these comments and it's just ghost. And people are like, yeah. I go, yeah, it turns out if you're on YouTube and you have YouTube premium, you can throw me in the background and you can keep doing what you want. I said, also, when you're watching and, you know, the spouse comes in and tells you to do X, Y, or Z, or the roommate comes in with a pizza, um, you cannot watch me on your TV, but you can on YouTube. Right. So I gave all the reasons why YouTube was good. And I told them, okay, so now in six months time, I am never going to stream on Facebook again. I'm only going to be on YouTube. So I'm highly suggest you come over. So what we would do is we would start the stream on both. I people you wouldn't get into fights about this, but everybody asked me about multi-streaming and I'm going to say no. Multi-streaming is actually a bad idea unless you have a true production reason for it, for the simple reason that it bifurcates the community. And I watched it happen when you're the last two people on Facebook and everybody else is on YouTube. They're like, I was looking for you guys that couldn't find you. And that's a very weird feeling. You're doing people are doing that to their communities over the vanity of getting one more extra person on another platform. And that's about you. That's not actually helping your community. So you got to tell them the reason why. Explain why you're doing it. Give them time to adjust and then put everybody in one spot. And the, the curmudgeons that finally moved over, they're like, oh, man, this YouTube thing is fun. And many of them signed up for premium and then later go, I didn't know premium was that good. I was watching commercials. And I was like, man, no, no self-respecting person that can afford it should not not watch commercials because it just it slows your roll. And there's so much great information on YouTube if you curate your stuff. If you just watch people dancing or whatever, maybe that's not really going to help you. But if you if you find your lane and you, you study, you can study a, a whole thing in YouTube. It's it's kind of funny. But um yeah, so I think that's a, a, a key ingredient. I think so just making a really strong what you did was create a really strong use case, like explaining to them the features and then those that moved along moved along which is contrary to some folks would be just like, okay, we'll just stay with them. Like Chris said, so you, you knew that this was better for your community essentially. Yeah. And it's, you, sometimes you have to tell them cause they just won't know. Right. Or, or, you know, they're getting information from a lot of places and I'm not trying to say that my way was the right way, but I, I did the homework, if you will, for them and explain that one of the best things. And it's funny because I was, going on for the last two years about how YouTube is getting a podcasting tab. YouTube will become the dominant podcasting app. And I still stand by that statement. And when they kind of like open the kimono a little bit in October, everybody was like, Oh, Doc's been screaming this for like the last 18 months, you know? And then now they're, they're fixing it. They tied the OB. They're getting their cuts that are done. They're almost ready to step out. And once they step out, everybody, too bad. It's over. Because I've been telling you guys forever to line up, be ready for the video-based podcast on YouTube. It's coming. And I've been involved in a video-based podcast since 2010. What did we figure out? It's 18 now? No, actually, it's longer than that. So it's been around. It's not new. But if you tell them and you line up and you show them the benefits, you do all the homework, yeah, I think people will accept it a lot more. And so some people, you just have to be willing to do that. Keely. Yeah, just to sort of tag in there, this is something that I did learn from Doc. And I remember when I first joined his community and his live streams, he was talking about not multi-streaming at first. I thought that doesn't seem right. And then of course I did it and it worked. And that I took that principle and applied it to the way that I look at community platforms. Because again, People will say, oh, you know, I don't I don't want to move from Facebook to Discord and my people won't come and things like that. You have to give them a reason why there has to be something inherently valuable that you can provide on that next community platform that you can't give on the last one. And if you can, then, well, why are you moving? But the the level of of intimacy, the organization, all the things that I've talked about uh, several times about Discord, that's that's something that that gives that inherent value. And then at the end of the day, the people who don't want to come are the people who weren't getting value out of your stuff anyway. 
And they're not people that you want to have in your community because you're clearly not able to serve them the way that they that they are looking for, the way that they want. So really, it's a win-win proposition in all ways. And I definitely learned that from Doc. Next question. Alexander Knight, Vancouver, British Columbia. And Alexander says, I've been producing a client's podcast since 2021. It's been growing slowly and has a couple of hundred people that come back every week. I was thinking of opening up Discord to create a community and encourage conversation. Is it too early to start? Never that. <laughs> I think never that. You know, podcast community building is so good right now. Because one of the things that you can do when you get a chance is do a live event or a pseudo live event. Oh, sorry, they're called virtual events, Doc. Um, I think that building a community around a podcast is amazing. And I know what that's like <laughs> um, because I've gone to Macworld where people that would, you know, listen to the, all the podcasts that I kind of grew up listening to. We would have events at various places throughout San Francisco during the weeks of Macworld. So we'd meet at the Chieftain or we'd meet at one of the other spots nearby. And those were the best events ever. So definitely start your community as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, you just got to think of what can you offer them? Pre-show, after show, maybe a, a round table discussion, things like that. And you might birth an entirely brand new podcast that might do better than your original podcast because of what you create in the community. You'd be amazed. Healy. Make sure you took notes on that. The pre-show, after show, that is the formula right there. I'm having a lot of success in doing that with my uh, with my live streams on YouTube. I do a little pre-show where I literally do my pre-show testing in front of my people and they get to tell me, Keely, that scene's broken. Oh, your mic is bad and all that sort of thing. So I have my own little Zoom production back room and they just happen to be in Discord. They happen to be the people that I love to hang out with. But... Um, I think that a lot of creators are are worried about starting their community too soon and they're worried about it not being uh, a vibrant community. Make it purpose-based. So the way that I started is I brought my moderators in from who, who were helping me on YouTube and my senior community members. I brought them into my Discord first and said, hey, let's talk about the things that we need to talk about as moderators, what we're going to do on the next show, how we're going to run this thing. How are we going to deal with this particular person? And so we, I, I was able to acclimatize them to the area. We were able to, to build some value, start setting out culture in the general channels. And then when things started to grow, it felt like it was already a populated cool place to be. So yes. yeah, give it a reason for there and it, it will, it will work. I promise. And they also help you find out your moderators are oftentimes, Oh, people, if you do any type of live production and you don't have moderators, you're asking for trouble. Uh, Hershey would tell you, like, I'm pretty sure it was one of the first five people to come to my live streams and there was only like five or six of us. And then I was like, the one day I remember seeing something weird happening in the chat and one of my um, now community members, Rob, was there. I was like, Rob, you have to be a moderator. He goes, I don't know what to do. If you see this person come up again, just kick them out. That was it. That was the start, you know, of the whole moderation thing. But you have to have moderators and they will help you build the inside structure of your community because they can help you see what the weak parts are. Right. Oh, you need to add this. I'm in this other community. You should add this. OK, cool. And so, yeah, I think that's extremely helpful. Can we park on that for a moment? So you mentioned that like moderators, what else would you say is needed in this community building um, process? Like people, people wise. Moderators are really good. And if you cannot do it by yourself, you kind of want like an onboarding team, which can still be part of your moderators, but someone to come in and show people the ropes. Um, Right now, mine is set up as bots, so to speak. They kind of give you the ropes. You come in, you click the little things you need to click, and they will put you in the appropriate areas. And so we have that. And then you start to identify who your key people are. Like, So you're rewarding. That's a key. That's a key. So you're rewarding members for their input, right? So just like we had a volunteer, uh, I think Bill, in the 
when I'm, you know, getting ready to come in, you know, and he's like, hey, I've only been doing this for a little bit, but look, I'm volunteering so I can learn. Brilliant. Oh, my goodness. Whoever came up with that idea, Alex, <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant because now he's going to tell everybody, yo, I'm doing this thing and I'm, I get to do this. That brings a whole bunch of people who love and support him will show up to watch the show. So even though you're helping him, you know, the, the true altruism helping him and helping him, you know, get better at what he does, he will automatically go out and drag people to the party, right? When you give people their, their flowers, as we say in the community, when you give people their flowers before it's too late, they will take care of you. So good. And coming in from the comments, Jack says, Discord is great for community building because it really increases community engagement. And Deborah says, major key alert. So the reward ac aspect that you just shared, a, a gem drop, mic drop moment. Next question. Well, it touches on what he was just talking about. This was actually my question from San Diego. Can you talk about some of the glitches or challenges you encountered along your community building path and how you worked around or through them? The hardest one was I didn't eat my own dog food and I was trying to just be superhero to everyone. And you can't do that because that will tax you really quickly. So now that I've done some rearranging and adjusting the community, I have set up sort of this idea that when someone wants to come in, we let them in. And then the minute I get an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face or a conversation with them, I need to find out where they are in their skill level. Because I think our community is at the point right now where I could not bring in someone like my sister. Don't watch this. I could not bring Tiana in, right? If I brought my older sister in here, like, in a, first of all, she would tell everybody in the community about how long it took me to get out of diapers. And second of all, um, she would just be lost. Like it wouldn't be comfortable for her and she wouldn't feel right. And it would, it was, it would actually hurt her more than it would help her because we're not, we're not one-on-one anymore. We're probably closer to 104, more like 201. So she wouldn't necessarily fit because she's so far back. Right. And I, unless I want to build a separate space and let one of my moderators control that, which is probably going to end up what's happening with what will probably happen. Sorry, five o'clock in the morning face. Um, it, uh, yeah, I, I, you just have to be willing to tell yourself that every single person that comes to my door isn't exactly appropriate and I'm okay with that. But also what I offer my people is like, listen, I am, Retired. I spent some time, you know, in cad in cadre or cadre, however you want to pronounce it, as a as a drill sergeant. I'm a little tough. If you want somebody, why you got to shake your head and say yes, Hershey? Um, <laughs> if if you want somebody to be like, oh, cute, da, 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 hold your hand, yo, that's probably not going to come for me. I'm a little bit, you know, rough, but I will put you in the hands of somebody that will tell you that everything is okay when your audio is bad. Me, I'm going to yell at you about your audio or I'm going to yell at you about lighting or I'm going to yell at you about, you know, when you're doing an interview, asking a question and asking a question and asking a question versus asking a question and shut up. Right? So I'm like, if you want somebody to handle, I'll put, I got a community for you. I will guide you that direction. So be willing to turn someone away, but try to also be, able to provide them with a resource if you are not that fit. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, what are some of the most useful tools for managing conflicts within online communities? Don't start none, won't be none. I'm just joking. <laughs> Sorry, am I going to get in trouble for that, Mr. Brown? Um, I, you know, I think luckily only ever had one and it was so early on and I think the thing that really helped is that was what made me decide I needed to set clear rules. It happened really early on, like within the first week or so. And so I released one of the members right away and sent them away, told them why I had to send them away and, you know, got one of those, well, it's a both sides thing. And I'm like, no, it's my community. I get to make this decision. It's, it's a you problem. And sorry, you can't be here. But once that happened, 
I immediately went back in and and readdressed the rules because I didn't put any because I didn't think it was necessary because I was crazy enough to think that adults are adults and you know that's good. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so, um, yes, basically, I luckily have only had it happen once. I don't really, I don't really, I guess I don't offer, how can I say this without sounding mean? I don't offer the look of somebody that would stand for something, so it just doesn't come that way. Keely. Right? I, I'm oh, very sorry, grounded. Go yeah, go ahead, Keel, because she probably has a better answer than me. <laughs> no, not really. I I think what's interesting about Doc's response, though, it's very much you know, he didn't mention a piece of software or auto moderation or any tricks like that. There just is no replacement for the people skills. I've tried using auto moderation in my own communities and other people's communities, and it just doesn't seem to catch the nuances of things. For example, in, in my own FH Empires community, it gets a little sweary at times because we're casual. It's a place where we feel safe and we can be those people and joke around with each other because we can't do that when we're out on the pitch and we're, you know, inside the community, we have a certain level of professionalism we have to show. So it's a bit of a place where people can let off a little steam. Auto mod doesn't understand that. It just doesn't get us. So <laughs> the the greatest tool that you're ever going to have in order to avoid conflict to manage conflict are good people. And those are the people who understand what the values of the community are, what you're trying to promote, and to understand that you're not going to please everybody all of the time, but you can always have good communications with good people. Alex? Yeah, I know that. I mean, this is uh, Office Hours, my fourth or fifth um, community that I built. And and we a couple of things that we learned pretty quickly was, number one is to set a handful of rules, but not too many. Like people get very legalistic. If you start having, if you've got 40 rules, people are going to figure out how to follow. And I know this because I'm a lawyer's son. So I was the master growing up of following the letter and not the spirit of the, of the, of the law, you know. And, um, and so, you know, you, you, hey, there's a handful of things. Now for us, different from what Keely, Keely does, no swearing, uh, no religion, no politics. And we, we take that out not because it makes people better. It's because it pushes out a certain group of people that would that feel like this is where what they want to do. And, and a lot of our folks, I mean, it's not like I'm not political or, or into, you know, w w I would love to sit around and fire and talk about religion or, or politics or whatever. But I find that it's a really easy way for people to see how they're different. You know, and 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 what we want to do is see what they're how they're the same, you know. And uh, we add real names, so we won't even let you talk if you don't give us a real name. And again, it's a filter. It's not. It doesn't make people better. It's a filter to knock people. You know, to have people who don't want to do that not be there. Um, and it, we find that it calms. It's calming. But I totally agree with uh, Doc and and Keely in a lot of it. One of the things I have to always think about is. Two people upset in a community both love the community. If they didn't love it, they'd leave. <laughs> so if they're angry and they're talking about it, they 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 may not agree with each other about how it should go. But they both they both it's both it's important to both of them, and we have to figure out how like how can we get them to get the part that they like and sort out. And it's it's always a human thing. Like sometimes there's weeks where I spend five or six hours or more, sometimes ten or fifteen hours working on one relationship, one set of relationships between two two members. So uh, it's 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 important. You know, yeah, you know what's funny, Alec. I just want to add one more thing. This really really quickly. I think one of the most hilarious things to me, without going too deep, is I am not a very religious person. But when I first started my community. It was like me and 10 pastors. And I'm like, my grandmother is setting me up, like making me be around church after I got away from church as a kid. Like I, I joined the army to not have to go to church anymore. <laughs> it was kind of funny how if you, if you just normal human being and you try not to be a bad person, those things don't become a problem. And you know, they they learn quickly that a lot of people in our community don't want to hear them come and try to evangelize the group. So they've never become a problem. Some of my best friends and I my sister even laughs at me that it's pretty funny that, you know, a large portion of my community are pastors with relatively large churches. And it's like, I can't believe that you sit around and teach a 
bunch of pious people when you consider yourself to be anti, but it just happens, right? So you never can tell. So just, you're right. Like, don't set too many rules, but you got to have a couple of basics. Well, and, and I don't talk about religion because I don't care about it or I don't think it's important. I don't talk about it because it allows everyone who's religious to be part of the conversation without people feeling like they're on the outside. So we have, exactly. what I love is that we'll have discussions and we'll have a rabbi and a, and, and a and Buddhist and a, and, a, and a Christian and all these other, and, and an atheist all having conversations about how to get something done, you know, and be connected as human beings, but not necessarily get turned off by yep. the belief systems that are that, they, that that each one of them have. Next question. Bob Sturdivant in San Antonio, Texas says, Hi, Doc. Is there any equipment and or software that you've used that you'd feel didn't really bring anything to your style of show? And of course, that you really feel you could, uh, some that you really feel you could not do without. Okay, so... I can do the ones I could not do without a lot easier. Um, the script, I could not function without the script. I absolutely love it. Um, Otter.ai, also super important to me. Like it Because I come up with random ideas for my videos or for my communities. It The dumbest possible places. I don't know why my brain does this to me, but I'll be in the middle of the grocery store squeezing avocados and I'm like, I got an idea. So I can pull up Otter and spit out an idea and, you know, put it away. Um, so those two are like automatic for me. Of course, Ecamm, it's on 24 seven. I can record a video at a beep. I don't have to set anything up. I don't have to press any buttons. I just press record on the stream deck and it can just go. So being ready to generate content as fast as possible without doing a lot of stuff will make your job better, right? You'll just become a better content creator. Um, I can't say I've really tried too many software that didn't really work out for me. There is a uh, drafts also has to be in the list. Um, if, if I have a computer and I install it or when I go to someone else's computer and I'll go to pull up drafts and it's not there, I'm like, Oh, Oh, got to use a regular notepad, which is cool. But, but when you get used to drafts, like, you know, it's just it's just there. But, yeah, I I can't really think of anything that I've tried that I, that I would say got in the way with one exception. And I'll, I'll say this because I know what they're doing, but it's, it's not their fault. But I'm really angry at them. So in the beginning, I was trying to show my community cool places where they could get the graphics and the things they need in order to build shows really fast. So the low hanging fruit at the time would have been Envato Elements. And Envato Elements is almost perfect, except for one thing and one thing only. When you try to find a, a file that is, you know, sound clip or a, um, a uh, swoosh or a dash, you're listening to it, trying to see how it fits in your show, and every two seconds, audio jungle. Audio, I was like, please, I'm trying to hear if this fits. Audio jungle. Oh, my God. So I, I had to get rid of that one because of that one thing. It's They're trying to make sure that people don't take things from them, but this is good for your community. Keep this in your head. If your security is at the point where it's invasive to your customers, you're being over secure. So like Neiman Marcus once said, you know, the paradise, we are not going to put together this high level anti shoplifting thing for the 2% of people that might shoplift from us. If it's going to ruin the experience for the 98% of the people that won't. Right. Same thing with their return policy. They have the most insane return policy because there's only a handful of people that will get the outfit and then wear it to the wedding and then return it. There's probably less than 2%. So don't be, you know, mean to the rest of them because a lot of people work from a, a space of scarcity and I prefer to work from a space of abundance. So that's the only one I can think of. And it's only because of their scarcity mindset just ruins the experience. Next question. Harshid Trivedi here in Daytona Beach, Florida, and on the panel says, what experience has brought you to a more inclusive thought related to your community and surroundings? Uh, you know, growing up in combination of New York, D.C., and then Hawaii, and then going to Japan, China, Korea, you know, in duty stations and things like that, um, Hawaii is very melting pot oriented kind of place. So is New York. So is DC. So it's kind of just built in from my upbringing, if you will. 
uh, but my curiosity, <laughs> like my curiosity is like, I need to know everything about everything. So when someone comes in, in the room or, you know, and something that I don't understand, I'm going to ask you questions because and I, they might be uncomfortable because sometimes, you know, I'm a nerd. I just answer, ask questions like a nerd. I don't really have feelings, if you will. I just ask questions. So I need to know the reason behind something. So I'll ask those questions. And I think in a way, that level of curiosity almost makes you, you know, sort of inclusive because you're just nosy. You know, well, I call it curious. My family calls it nosy. <laughs> Harshid? Yeah, mahalo to you, Doc Rock. I, I just want to say, uh, you know, I've been into your channel a few times, and even the perspective of I'm a vision impaired person doesn't, it doesn't feel like I am. I just walk into this wonderful wealth of information, but it's everybody being friendly to each other, depending on if you're on the Discord side, you know, chatting it up on YouTube. But at least you, what I notice is you, you highlight each person. So whomever it might be is, hey, this person has asked to at least say hi to me and, you know, let's talk about it or let's talk about whatever topic that might be spoke about. So I really appreciate that aspect that you do bring to your community and that it's an example for me to show other folks, hey, check out this dude, Doc Rock, man. He, he has a couple of channel, you know, videos here that might interest you and that might build your own community. So thank you for what you do. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, I can almost tell you when you came in, it was like, I was just starting to do the the schedule. Like I picked the Tuesday, Saturday to be perfect. And it was like the end of August or the beginning of September of 2020. And then you popped in show. We were talking about something. And then you slid into the DM later and said, thank you for answering my questions. I appreciate that. And yes, I'm old as dirt, but I remember things like that. <laughs> That's more important. Ask me what's on the grocery list. I couldn't tell you. Karen would be super mad at me that I don't know, but I remember the day that you slid into the DM and you said, thank you. Because as much as I might've said something that impacted you, you sliding into the DM and saying, thank you impacts me. And so, yeah, number one, I'm going to try to say hi to everybody, especially when I catch new people. Oh, I would razz the news people. I would tell them right away, listen, you're going to come in and we're going to talk about you. And I'm going to call you something other than your name. Cause I call nobody by their name. This is how I remember the name, right? And then we're just going to go through some stuff. And I remember I'm um, saying to you, I want to make sure I say your name right. And so I said it and you go, yeah, that's close enough. I go, yeah, you're probably going to get like Hershey bar or something after this, but it's close enough. So, you know, that's just, that's my way of, I know what it's like to be wanting to learn something and nobody will help you, Right. All of the people in here that knees hurt in the morning when they wake up used to go to the computer store back when everything came on the, you know, five and a half inch floppy. And you first walk in, there's a bunch of guys like in a circle and you would be standing there for hours trying to ask them a question about the grappler, which was this printer thing for old school Apple computers or, you know, about, you know, shareware I used to buy it at the store on the floppy and you were looking for something that you can use to like recover a word perfect document. And you'd have to sit there and wait a half an hour before they would even acknowledge you. And then when you would ask them, they'd be like, look it up. There was no Google back then. So like, I know what it feels like when the computer guys wouldn't answer you. So when I became one, I'm answering everything. I will never hide something from anyone because I know what it feels like to have a question and nobody answered. Wow, Doc, that is is awesome. And we thank you so much for your, your time with us today. And I want to make sure that we give you the, the last word because you've been sharing so much on just community, community building, international, building international communities as well. What um, final gem would you like to share with us? Uh, I'm going to go back to my original one. And I think the purpose is the most important thing. I, I actually have a, not, not a sales anymore. I don't even think they're available. So don't go looking, but I had a t-shirt in my merch store called purpose and intent and purpose because people say that all the time and they say it almost as a colloquialism. I don't think they really know what it means. Oh, for all intents and purposes, half the people say it wrong, intensive purposes, but <laughs> for all intents and purpose, I do everything with intention. And I try to do everything with purpose um, because the sooner you can get to that, the sooner you can help solve 
your issues, but as well as solve as many people's other issues out there. And something that I say all the time, I don't think I made it up. I probably picked it up along the way sometimes, but I know I probably repeat it more than anybody else is when I started, I had no intention of starting a side hustle. And all of my creator coach friends out there are telling everyone, start a side hustle. You can do this and da da da. And I tell my community, eh, eh, if you're part of my squad, we do side helpful. Right? And as lo- right, Hershey, you know, right? I say it all the time. If you're helping folks, you will do perfectly fine. If your whole goal is to dive into this just to, you know, like chase a bag, you'll get frustrated real quick and you're probably going to fail. And then um, the, I guess the last thing is Alex Knight, you know, nice sign. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Doc Rock, community manager at Ecamm, who has spent the, the past hour with us answering all of your questions. Producers, thank you so much for your questions. And of course, the panelists for Without Which answering our questions during the first hour and our back end team for Without Which. This would not be possible. And I want to make sure that we also say that tomorrow, Tuesday, we will be talking about understanding alpha channels. So you want to come back tomorrow. Well, of course, you want to come join us and hang out in after hours. But if you want to learn the schedule, for the rest of the week, head over to officehours.global. And it looks like we have gone 40,249 miles on the Taluk Traversal, and which is 64,774 kilometers. That's more than 364 million bananas. So thank you, everyone, for watching. And we'll see you in after hours. Bye. How do we get Doc Rock to come on? Once a week. Once a week. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I got to wake up early. Okay, I'll right. wake up early for you. Uh, once a week. Just come on. Pick, you pick, a, pick a day. No, a, no ASMR, Lindsay, damn it. <laughs> I, will, I will wake up for you. you only have not, not many people, but I'll wake up for you. This is the whisper close. We do it every day. And I don't know why. <laughs> she has no clue. <laughs> Even I knew the whisper close. Come on, dog. Great to have you here, though, Doc. Come on. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Bill, I want you to be my permanent voicemail. Thank you. That's very sweet of you. (laughs) Good show, good show.